Good morning. It's 830 on Monday, May 16th. I'm Desiree Frazier, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, the state Senate Corrections Chair says there's progress at Parchment Prison amidst a threat of a federal lawsuit. And we talk maternal health in Mississippi with Sisters in Birth CEO Getty Israel. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. The threat of a federal lawsuit hangs over Mississippi's Parchman Penitentiary, that in the wake of a report from the Department of Justice that details, quote, severe systemic problems that are exacerbated by serious deficiencies in staffing and supervision by the state. The report reflects findings from the DOJ's two-year investigation of the prison. The probe started after an outburst of violence in the late 2019, early 2020 Time frame. Democratic Senator Juan Barnett of Heidelberg is chair of the State Senate Corrections Committee. When they came in and inspected, it was at the height of everything that was going on uh, inside Parchment. And in my opinion, that's what their that's what their report was based on. But since uh, but since they've been there, and since Commissioner Kane has been there and working with the legislatures. At the Capitol, we have made some significant changes uh, to Parchman. Uh, I've been up several times um, since then and, and saw many, many improvements that uh, you know that I was satisfied with. Uh, have we fixed everything? No. Uh, are we working on it? Yes. You know, it, it was something that I stated before. You know, it's something that we inherited, and we're doing our best to fix. You know, to fix all of those problems. Uh, that they address most of those things have been taken care of, um, but we're still working on it. You know, it's it's not going to be an overnight fix. Um, everyone needs to understand that. But at the same time, we are working speedily to you know to make sure that that we are in compliance. And and I feel like uh, you know in the in the near future, you know, we will reach those goals and we will satisfy those things that are most of the things that the Department of Justice have you know, uh, had listed in their report. What are an example of some of the things that have been done to improve conditions? Well, living conditions have been fixed. Um, we have moved individuals. We have recently, you know, they opened up Walnut Grove, so that allowed uh, MDOC to transfer um, some of the bad, you know, some of those who, was, you know, um, had bad behavior to those places, as well as take some of those out and place them uh, in another part of Walnut Grove so that they can get um, additional help that they need, also additional education training. So uh, we've taken a great stride to try to make sure that we can keep it as safe as possible and as clean as possible. And also, you know, uh, we've also worked on our food system and other things. So we're working on making sure that we can fix uh, a lot of those things that we have had problems with. Have you been able to upgrade mental health, provide more mental health services? and um, You know, that's something that, that, we are, that we are definitely working on. You know, not only the mental health piece, uh, but we're working on uh, uh, getting additional personnel uh, to come and work. But, you know, that's a problem that uh, MDLC is not the only one that's having. You know, everywhere you look, there's a help wanted sign. And we're doing everything that we can uh, to encourage individuals to come and work for the Department of Corrections, even to the point to where we have greatly increased uh, salaries and those things. So just saying that we could bring people in is not, you know, that doesn't always fix it. You know, you have to find people that are willing to come and work and and, and, and those things, you know. But like I said, you know, my comment earlier is that help Help wanting and people wanting to go to work is something that that's being faced throughout this country, and people just need to, you know, understand that. You know, I understand that you know people may want to blame us for not hiring those people, but what do you say when there's a shortage of school teachers, even though we've allocated additional funds? Uh, where the, you know, what do you do in private industries where they've even increased um, their wages, and we still and you still can't find people to go to work. So it's, it's, you know, it's just a problem that we're facing, but we're trying to do everything we can to address it. 
Mississippi, the state of Mississippi is facing several lawsuits involving the corrections department and conditions at Parchman and the violence at Parchman. Does this open the door to saying that those lawsuits really have more of a um, potential to go forward? I can't answer that to say, you know, whether well, they have the potential to go forward or not. But if you remember, you know, Alabama was faced with some of the similar things. And, and, and when they started to do some of the corrective measures, you know, they satisfied the Bill of Justice and, and some of those things went away. Some of the things they're still working with. So, you know, at this time, I, I have no idea, but I do know that we are working on it, you know. Uh, and like I said, you know, it, it was something that we all inherited. Uh, and as a chairman of corrections, you know, it, it has been it has been tough, but, but we have made great strides to make sure um, that we can fix some of those things. And not only just working at Parchment, but throughout our whole entire uh, MDOC, you know, in Mississippi, um, you know, as far as passing that meaningful legislation that will, you know, result in, you know, in less people being incarcerated. Uh, I'm hoping that it will reduce our recidivism rate, you know, and uh, if all of those things, you know, happen, you know, as we plan for those things to happen, then that's a savings to the state of Mississippi where we can repurpose a lot of those dollars to uh, to continue to address some of the other issues that we may have. One thing at the end of the document, it does say that the Department of Justice says that you have 49 days after the issuance of the letter, which is dated April 20th of 2022, the Attorney General could then initiate a lawsuit. Okay, well, uh, we just have to see what happens. This is an issue that you have expressed a great deal of passion for. Do you feel like you're getting enough support from other lawmakers to do what needs to be done to get out from under lawsuits and allegations of I, mismanagement? I, I, honestly, I honestly do. You know, in the last two years alone, we have passed several pieces of legislation, several that I've authored. Several that have been, um, you know, that has been authored by uh, my colleagues on the House of Representatives, and to get the support of, of the Lieutenant Governor, to have the support of the Speaker, uh, to have the support of the majority of both chambers, and to also, you know, have those pieces of legislation signed into law by the Governor, um, you know, that's something that very few people talk about uh, when we talk about, you know, trying to address those things that we are that we all are faced with in Mississippi is the fact that, that you know, regardless of, of, of who's author in those pieces of legislation, whether it's Democrat or whether it's Republican, we all can agree that we have to work together to fix those things. And, and I just find that something that, that's good that needs to be talked about is the fact that regardless of our party lines or regardless of, of other things that we may not agree on, we have found a way to agree to, to start to fix some of those things. And, and I think it's because of, of of my passion that I've always had to make sure that we can fix those things and sharing those things and, and getting others to understand that. I think that's, you know, I think that's the reason why we have been able to collectively uh, work together to fix a lot of those issues. As serious a problem as this is and one that requires immediate attention, are there any particulars that you are looking to deal with in the next legislative session? Well, right now there are several things that we are considering. Uh, I'm not really talking about a whole lot right now, but we are beginning to uh, consider some other things. Um, and as you know, the year go on, then we'll start having hearings and, and sharing those ideals or concerns that we have so that uh, the next legislative session, hopefully we can push some of those things through that will further uh, improve our conditions further, you know, to improve uh, or to help those individuals who are who will be released or about to be released, you know, to address the whole array of, of, of things as it relates to uh, MDOC. Does it have anything to do with restoring the vote? Well, we have introduced legislation on that, and that's something um, that, you know, we haven't all come to a consensus on, but we 
uh, I, I'm sure that that will be one of the things that uh, that we'll continue to work on. Whether or not it actually happens, you know, we can't guarantee that. I can't guarantee that. I can only hope that it will, but I know that it will be uh, something that we will be um, um, dealing with again uh, in our next legislative session. Senator Juan Barnett, thank you so much for your time and speaking with us. Thank you. Coming up, we talk maternal health in Mississippi with Sisters in Birth CEO Getty Israel. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Mississippi has long been a crucible for abortion rights. Now, as the Supreme Court seems prepared to overturn Roe v. Wade, the battle over abortion within the state is as fiery as ever. But that conflict is only one facet of the maternal health crisis in the Deep South that's hitting black women especially hard. That's according to Getty Israel. She operates a pregnancy center in Jackson called Sisters in Birth. It is a community-driven clinic, midwifery clinic, that integrates community and clinical care. By that, I mean uh, we use midwifery, the midwifery model and community health worker model together. By that, I mean we're providing the clinical care in the clinical setting, but we're also providing very crucial evidence-based non-medical community health services that include, uh, like providing home visitation to pregnant women or a woman who's had a baby, Uh, breastfeeding, childbirth preparation, preparing them for labor, going into labor with them, advocating for them, and uh, education, uh, maternal child health education, breastfeeding counseling in the home, postpartum support after she's had the baby, uh, getting them healthy, preventing diseases that we know will undermine or compete with the pregnancy like gestational diabetes, gestational uh, hypertension, preeclampsia, heart disease, All of those diseases, morbidities I just mentioned, are in play here because we have the highest obesity rate in the country and we have the highest pre-pregnancy rate. So when women, especially black women, present pregnant, they often are already overweight. They have not had any uh, primary care before becoming eligible for Medicaid, which covers about 65% of pregnancies and births here. Your thoughts on the whole issue of Mississippi's 15-week abortion ban before the Supreme Court? Look, I'm just going to say my position on Mississippi's approach in general. It's the wrong approach. It's political. It's driven by politics. It's not even driven by religion because you can't claim to be a Christian and treat pregnant women the way we do in Mississippi. How are we treating them? Poorly. Uh, I think a lot of Mississippians think, well, they can qualify for Medicaid. (laughs) Uh, Listen, a woman needs more than access to a doctor to have a healthy pregnancy. If having access to a doctor were the answer, then we wouldn't have the horrible numbers we have. Uh, We have the highest C-section rate every year. We have the highest premature birth rate, the highest low birth weight baby, baby weighing under 2,500 grams. We have the highest infant mortality, babies dying before their first birthday. We have one of the highest maternal mortality rates Uh, in the country, and black mothers and babies are disproportionately accounted for in all those categories. When they come to you, have they had prenatal care before? Are you their first introduction to it? Sometimes we're the second, especially for black women. The complaint I get from black women who come to us who've been somewhere else is poor service, doctors who don't offer any education, clinics that don't offer any education, no childbirth preparation, especially when you're dealing with a woman who's pregnant for the first time and she's young. She's young, she's naive, she's innocent, she's vulnerable. She needs someone to wrap their arms around her, hold her hand, guide her. Clinics don't provide, typically don't provide that kind of support. That's social support. That's education. That's public health. Clinics provide clinical care. You come in, they get your blood, they get your blood pressure, your vitals. You sit in one room, they move you to another room, to another room, and eventually someone comes in and spends about five minutes with you. And it's usually not the doctor, it's usually his nurse. 
the doctors usually show up to deliver the baby. And that's usually when the baby's about the crown. Nurses do most of the work. We know that. Um, so we go far, far, far beyond that. That's why I said it's community driven. We were a community health organization before we became a clinic. Sisters in Birth was designed to provide that crucial support for women that they don't get in the clinical setting. We were going to, to initially, we were going to, um, I was sending my community health workers to doctor's visits because what we learned was when a woman is not well-educated, not articulate, and she is intimidated by the white coat, she will cope, she will walk into that room with her head down and she will remain silent and he or she may use terminology that she doesn't understand, will give her orders she doesn't understand, will make decisions for her that she does not really want. And what, we, what the research also shows is that black women are less likely to be included in medical decisions about their bodies. Doctors are making decisions and saying, well, we're going to schedule you for an induction. They don't even know why. And what's an induction? A medical induction. Which, which means we're going to speed up, we're going to, we're going to take over the natural process. We're not going to wait for nature. We're going to use a drug called Pitocin, and that drug is going to initiate labor, even though your body's not ready. And they give her some reason for doing so. Sometimes it's medically justified. A lot of times it isn't. And what research shows is that black women are at risk of experiencing C-sections when they experience a medically induced induction. That's what the research shows. Very large research studies have shown that. Um, and so... Are those more dangerous, C-sections? A C-section is the number one surgery performed in Mississippi to the tune of over $220 million. All right? We have the highest C-section rate in the country. And when a woman gets her, experiences her first C-section, there's an 89% chance, according to the Blue Cross Blue Shield, I think, Foundation Research Study of 2016, that she will have a second and a third, especially in the southern region where C-sections are highest. Now, why are they highest? Well, obesity is a problem. But I find that black women who, don't, who are not even obese are likely to have a C-section. Uh, that's a question we'd have to ask doctors. Why are they so prone, so quick to schedule an, uh, an induction and or a C-section for black women? Is it because of body weight? Is it because of underlying underlying morbidities, well, let's just say it is because of hypertension. Maybe her blood pressure is going up, which can happen after 20 weeks. That's why prevention is so important. That's why it's so important to help them to gain a healthy body weight during the pregnancy. The Institute of Medicine in 2009, the Institute of Medicine issued a recommendation for doctors, meaning OBs, obstetricians, to follow uh, a gestational gestational weight gain recommendations, basically looking at the woman's BMI. There are four categories, underweight, normal weight, overweight, obese. Look at her weight. Don't just put it in the chart. Look at her weight. Where does she fall? If she's underweight, it recommends that she gains uh, within a certain range. And, and that is applied to every category. She, if she's overweight, within a certain range. Well, if most of the women you're seeing are overweight, you know you have an obesity problem. We know that because we're in Mississippi. Then why aren't you talking to women about eating healthy and showing them how to do that if you don't understand how to do it, doctor, because you didn't study nutrition in graduate school, in, in medical school. I get that. You didn't study public health in, in medical school. I get that. Then work with organizations, work with dietitians, work with people who understand nutrition and the role that it plays in pregnancy because it plays a major role. Many women are living on fast food diets and soft drinks and black women have the highest consumption of sweetened beverages like sweet tea and our OBs are not addressing it. And so that leads to or can lead to maternal morbidities. Maternal morbidities can lead to premature babies being born, C-sections, women developing heart disease and dying from it within the first year of life. Do you advise them one way or the other? Do they ask you for insight about having the baby or not having the baby? Women, some women call, most women who call us know they want to have a baby. Some women call, they've already decided they want to have a baby. They want a midwife. They want a natural experience. That's 
primarily why they call us. Some women call for an ultrasound to find out how far along they are. Uh, some women call because they are looking for uh, abortion services, and I talk to them. There's a doctor who works with me. We talk to them. We want to know why you're looking for an abortion, what's going on. And we, we're looking for an opportunity to, yes, change her mind, but not just change her mind by saying that's wrong, but figuring out what she needs. For instance, are you homeless? Is that why you want to have an abortion? Is it domestic violence? Is it because you're alone? Is it because you're unemployed? What, what is your reason? Women have reasons. They're just not waking up saying, I'll have an abortion. So, so you would prefer that they have the baby? Yes. Yes. Listen, we lost over, oh, over the last 10 years, we've lost over 35,000, I think, black lives, if you will, to abortion in Mississippi. That's a hell of a lot of black lives to lose, particularly in the era of Black Lives Matter. So, yeah. We'll hear more from Getty Israel on tomorrow's show. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Stick around for a full morning of Mississippi Radio. Coming up at 9, it's the Castal Gardner. Then at 10, it's Now You're Talking with Marshall Ramsey. And at 11, don't miss Southern Remedy. Find past episodes of this and other shows online, mpbonline.org. Have a great day. 